invite you now to stand, please, for the reading of our scripture from Matthew chapter 27. Get the numbers right. Beginning with verse 33. Matthew 27, verse 33. Let us listen reverently, because this is God's holy word. And when they had come to a place called Golgotha, which means place of a skull, and they gave him wine to drink mingled with gall, and after tasting it, he was unwilling to drink. And when they had crucified him, they divided up his garments among them, casting lots. And sitting down, they began to keep watch over him there. And they put up above his head the charge against him, which read, This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. At that time, two robbers were crucified with him, one on the right and one on the left. And those passing by were hurtling abuse at him, waggling their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. In the same way, the chief priests also, along with the scribes and elders, were mocking him and saying, He saved others. Himself he cannot save. He is the King of Israel. Let him now come down from the cross and we shall believe him. <clears throat> he trusts in God. Let him deliver him. If he takes pleasure in him, for he said, I am the Son of God. And the robbers also who had been crucified with him were casting the same insult at him. Now from the sixth hour, darkness fell upon all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why has you forsaken me? Thus far the reading of the word. Let's pray. Father, open this text to us, we pray. Strengthen me to proclaim it with power and grace, without which I cannot do justice to this glorious insight into your beloved son's suffering. Please, Lord, will you enable us to honor Jesus afresh in considering this, we pray in his name, amen. Please be seated. I have a request if somebody would be willing to fill up the water glass, not, please not a bottle, because that involves unscrewing it, etc. Thank you. This morning, I want you to consider particularly and to think through very carefully the significance of Christ's declarative cry in the form of a rhetorical question. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Thank you very much. Yes, sir. When we use the word Christ alone, most of the time I think we use it very properly to speak of there is no salvation in any other but Christ alone, uh, that he alone is the one who can redeem his people, there is salvation in no other, and wonderfully proper ways such as there's no other name given under heaven among men on earth whereby we may be saved but the name Christ Jesus. Peter's sermon in Acts. But there is another sense in which Christ's aloneness, I believe, is not often addressed. When we think of the suffering of Christ, we think of the suffering of pain on the cross. That's something most of us can relate to. When we've had real physical pain, then the idea of Christ's pain on the cross hanging there with the weight of his body pulling on the two nails in his two hands and the nails through his feet is almost beyond comprehension to try to imagine the agony of it and the thirst that he experienced. 
If you think of his saying, I thirst, as one of his seven statements from the cross itself. And then the pain of having been beaten with a scourge, a terrible scourge, his back turned to a bloody, terrible exposure of the muscle tissues under the skin by that um, frightful practice of the Romans had of scourging. But do we talk much about his aloneness, his being forsaken? And I think it's helpful to do so very carefully and to begin even with a definition of the word alone in that sense. And Webster's 1828 dictionary puts it simply, it means without company or presence of another. Without company or presence of another. Separated by oneself, such as in divorce or death, or separation in a, uh, some natural tragedy. <clears throat> in every sense, it's the opposite <clears throat> of companionship. So think about this idea of aloneness biblically. Will you turn to Genesis chapter 2? Genesis 2. You may not have ever thought of it this way before, but aloneness is a moral issue, an ethical issue. Look at the words of our Lord in Genesis 2 and beginning with verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. When God says something is not good, it doesn't just mean lacking in some benefit. It also means it is not good ethically from his divine perspective. That's powerful. It is not good for man to dwell alone. And this he said before the fall. When he said concerning his creation, it is each part of his creation, God saw that it was good. That wasn't just a pleasant observation to interest people in centuries to come. It was also an ethical statement. The creation is good in the sense that it honors God and recognizing it as creation and not evolution is an ethical issue. So here at the beginning of the human race, God specifically says that aloneness is not good. Think for a minute, with some exceptions, once in a while there is an exception, but for the most part, as we are children, we take being together with our parents for granted. But as we get older, we begin to think a little bit about being with other people, the idea of friendship comes up, and sometimes young people do very foolish things in attempting to have friends in order to not be alone. And if you've not experienced that yourself, I suspect you've at least seen instances of it where sometimes children or young people made some very bad decisions in an attempt to overcome the sense, whether real or not, that they were alone. The passage that we read from Matthew 26 concerning Christ's prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane illustrates another aspect of aloneness. Christ rebuked them in one of the gospel records as saying, what could you not stay awake and pray and watch? That he had the aloneness of not having his fellow servants, his apostles, whom he had personally chosen, sensing the urgency of that situation and supporting him in prayer. He was not supported by the prayer of those who served with him. He was alone in petitioning his heavenly father. 
think of the flood. Noah and his family and all the animals are in the ark. And as the rain came for the first time in that wicked and violent society, and it was noted especially that it was violent, as those that were near the ark came to the ark, they realized that they were left alone by Noah. And Noah himself, God said, was alone with him, his wife, his three sons, and his three daughters-in-law. The Tower of Babel was a sovereign judicial discipline on an ungodly segment of Noah's descendants who had sought to have a community and a connection that exceeded God's will and his righteous judgment. And so he separated them apart and they had to leave each other alone and go in different ways because they could not understand each other. Think of Elijah as recorded in 1 Kings 19. Jezebel has threatened his life. He's run in the strength of the Holy Spirit from the north of Israel down to the Sinai. And then he says, when God asks him, why are you here, Elijah? He says, I alone am left in all of Israel who has not bowed the knee to Baal. And he said it twice. God asked him twice. And one of the things about aloneness that we may not realize often is that a profound sense of aloneness can even corrupt our judgment and our discernment. And I suggested that not uncommonly with teens who have not yet achieved the maturity to understand that that's not a necessary state if we were trusting in Christ, but indeed far from it. But Christ's whole life was an example of experiencing that bitter taste of aloneness. As a young baby, Herod tried to kill him because he didn't want Christ to survive. So he was alone in terms of the world as reflected by Herod but he was also rejected by the people in Nazareth, his hometown. They tried to push him off a cliff after they heard his sermon in which he rebuked them over their participation in the principle that a prophet is not without honor, save in his own country and his own home. He was rejected by the Gadarenes after healing the demoniac and the multitude of spirits going out of that man and into the swine the people of Gadara came to him and instead of rejoicing that a terribly afflicted person was healed, they begged him to leave their countryside, begged him to go, get out of the town. When you realize that the Pharisees' hostility towards Christ began early in his public ministry, especially and particularly, of his healing on the Sabbath, his church, as of course reflected in those men who, who uh, go governed the church, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the elders, began with hatred for his goodness to the man with the withered hand, for example. He would, once again, they left him alone, the church that should have come rejoicing in his messianic calling, they abandoned him. And as I've already suggested, as reflected in Matthew 26, he was, that night of his betrayal, abandoned by the apostles, left alone, and abandoned by Peter. And then our text in Matthew 27, he was abandoned by Almighty God, his heavenly Father. So, what are we to make of this? Are we to do something with this? Does this have any bearing on us personally as professing Christians? Well, I would begin by asking, do you believe without mental reservation that every one of us deserves, in and of ourselves, apart from Christ saving us, we deserve all the miseries of hell forever and ever, judicially speaking, 
in the eyes of an infinitely holy God who's absolutely and perfectly just. We deserve hell. When our children were growing up, sometimes they would complain that the other children they knew were allowed something and they were the only ones that weren't permitted some indulgence by their cruel parents. And they would not uncommonly whine, at least for a while. But that's not fair, Daddy. And I would say to them, get on your underworked knee bones and thank God he's not fair. Because if he were fair, which means you get what you deserve judicially, you would be in hell right now. And it's easy to lose that. And it's, I believe, one of the many subtle examples of the corrosion of a Christian consensus in our society that you see ads on TV. Treat yourself. You deserve to be kind to yourself. You deserve this particular lotion or you deserve that particular chocolate or whatever it is. That We've so corrupted that idea of what is deserved. But in fact, we deserve everything that hell can offer, judicially speaking. And every single aspect of Christ's suffering, every aspect, included some facet of the horrors of hell. Think for a minute. There's only one record in all of human history of somebody speaking from hell. And that's recorded for us in scripture by Luke. Of the rich man who pleads, remember this, for one drop of water on the tip of his tongue and Abraham speaking for the Lord says no there's a gulf which is cannot be crossed and the man said I'm tormented in this flame so the f horror of g gagging unending horrible thirst is compounded by being in the midst of flames and then what about his humiliation of being hanging, hung on the cross, being mocked while he hung there, scarcely dressed, largely unclothed, because the, remember the Roman soldiers cast lots for his garments. So he's in unbearable pain and is humiliated as his blood is shed in behalf of us. And it was so serious that from noon till three in the afternoon, God darkened the sun over all the face of the earth. So the sufferings that he endured met the justice of God on behalf of the redeemed. But that suffering included a sense of abandonment. Now think that during his public ministry, as recorded in John, Jesus told the the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the unbelieving Jews, I and my Father are one. And he spoke in that great high priestly prayer of his oneness with the Father, that believers may be one even as we are one, it was uh, part of that great uh, intercessory priestly prayer. And if you and I are not moved in some sense by his cry, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That that perfect relationship was for those hours rent asunder. The God was whom he was the eternal son proceeding from the father was lost. And I think even in meditating on it, we can only see a tiny tip of that iceberg of suffering that he underwent in being separated from the Father for us so that we, let's remember this, are not separated from Christ and the Father ourselves. When you think about heaven, is not the idea of being with Christ, with our Father in heaven, and with the saints a huge portion of of what we understand heaven to be in all its glory and wonder. Withness, I could put it that way, or to use an overworked word, togetherness. 
But the fact is that one of the aspects of heaven is the complete opposite of God's judicial wrath of separating himself from people that are not his elect. And I've often heard people say, and especially in my years in the Navy when I would rebuke people for their foul speech, particularly abusing the Lord's name, and pointing out that that was a sin that on one occasion only earns a person an eternity in, in hell and in, in punishment. And they'd say, well, that's probably where I should go because that's where all my friends are. And I would say to them, you are sorely mistaken because there is no friendship in hell. We forget that the common grace of God manifested here on earth, such as friendship and civil courtesies and an orderly society and things that we take for granted that God gives not just to the just but the unjust, rain and sunshine for believers and unbelievers alike, isn't in hell. And the aloneness of hell, I believe, is beyond description. Would you turn, please, to John 8? John chapter 8, beginning with verse 12. Again, therefore, Jesus spoke to them. This is John 8, 12, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The Pharisees therefore said to him, You are bearing witness of yourself. Your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from, where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You people judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it. Notice that he says, I'm not alone in bearing judgment if I do. But I and he who sent me, if I judge, we are together in our judgment. And I could pick others to reflect upon the richness of the unity that we have in Christ, which again is perhaps can be not said too often, is the antithesis, the opposite of judicial aloneness and the condemnation of aloneness in eternity. So what do you and I do with this? Well, first of all, let's go to Ephesians 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, we have some wonderful reminders, oops, it turned a little too far there, of the idea of adoption. Ephesians 1, beginning with verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in him, notice the, that phrase that occurs again and again in Ephesians 1, in him, in Christ. There's a connectedness there that is immeasurable. Just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him, in love he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself. 21 years ago, my wife and I had the privilege of accompanying our daughter and son-in-law to Russia, to St. Petersburg, which used to be called Leningrad under the Soviets, to an orphanage. It was Russian, St. Petersburg or Orphanage number 13. 
And in that remarkable event, we had the privilege of seeing the child that the Russian government had chosen for our son-in-law and daughter as the adopted child it would be permitted to leave Russia and truly placed in an adoptive state. And we went in that orphanage and it's pretty rough, some of the ways they took care of these little ones. They're overwhelmed, underfunded, and such things as we would probably not think about, but had a great bearing on these little ones in that orphanage. That when they needed their diapers changed, they didn't use the kind and sanitary methods in this country. They just pulled off the soiled diapers and held the child with their posterior under the ice cold tap water from the Dnieper River that runs through Leningrad or St. Petersburg. And of course, the children scream when that's done. So here, that's just a taste of what those little ones endured. And I was there, and a little fella came up to me. I'd say he was about two. And he grabbed my little finger and would not let go. And one of the workers said, you're probably the first man he's ever seen latched onto. Because men don't come to the orphanage. And it was a hard moment when we left, prying those little fingers off my finger and having to leave him alone. And that may help us get some sense that when we're in a community where we're well cared for and we have good friends, we don't really think through this issue of aloneness as a huge part of the curse that God removed through the perfect mediatorial messianic work of our Lord Jesus Christ. So to be adopted is profound. To be adopted, if you're an orphan, is an incredible blessing. And Jesus accomplished, among other things, our adoption as sons to God himself, verse 5 of Ephesians 1. Adoption is the refutation of spiritual aloneness. And we're adopted. That's the term the scripture uses over and over. To describe our union with Christ when we're saved. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Found by my adoptive heavenly father. Found to be taken out of a state of alienation and separation and aloneness and brought into the marvelous fellowship of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit. Romans 6, please. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace might increase? May it never be. How shall we who died in sin still live in it? Or do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Consider the connectedness of that, that God accepts 
Jesus' sacrificial death in the place of our punitive death at his judicial hands. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death in order that in Christ, in order that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. United to him in the likeness of his resurrection. That's why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says if you don't accept the resurrection of the dead, Christ didn't rise from the dead. You can't have one without the other. So close is that bond, that adoptive bond, that Christ's death is to be understood as the first fruits of ours. Thanks be unto God for such amazing union. So a few thoughts here by way of union. Would you turn please to John chapter 15. Gospel of John, chapter 15, part of the Last Supper discourse, that great collective teaching that summed up in so many ways the heart of his public ministry and, and opened up the fullness of the gospel treasures to us. John 15. I think I'll start with the third, fourth verse. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, so neither can you unless you abide in me. Abide in me. When we hear that word, we think ordinarily of dwelling, do we not? Living somewhere. You abide in your home. And in a short sense, you can say on a travel trip, you abode in a motel overnight. But it has the idea of dwelling, the word abide. I am the vine, verse 5, you are the branches. You are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. In Luke chapter 6, Christ said to the Jews, Why are you complaining when you can do absolutely nothing? You are so weak, you can do nothing of your own. As you sit here this morning, pondering these words, in your heart of hearts, do you honestly, without mental reservation, agree that if Christ didn't give you breath by breath by breath, you would die? And that one of the biblical ways of describing mortal death is to take away our breath. And then everything else is in addition to that, that he gives us, everything. Because we abide in him and he in us, and I more and more see myself as a slow learner. When I think of such things as it took me years to come to a sense of astonishment at the words of Christ abide in me. I believed it, but I don't think I appreciated it as typical of the fact that as we grow older, we more clearly see our sins of omission which far exceed, in most instances, our sins of commission. And not the least of which is the failure to come to grips with the enormous implication of the goodness of Christ even to the unregenerate. And how much more is the commandment in 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing, give thanks in everything, an appropriate commandment for God's redeemed people. But turn, please, to Hebrews 10. Hebrews chapter 10. Beginning with verse 23. 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, without fudging, without giving in and being fearful and worst of all denying him. But no matter what comes down the pike in the providence of God, holding fast the confession of our hope which is in Jesus Christ without wavering. But there's an and. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Now, would you agree that there's many places in the New Testament and uh, quite a number in the Old Testament that stress doing good deeds, not to earn merit, but as an expression of love to our King, our Savior, as pleasing to God, as required by God, to love and good deeds. So he could pick out, the author of Hebrews could pick out a hundred examples of doing good, not forgetting to do good, but look what he picks. Not forsaking our own assembling together, not abandoning our own forsake, assembling together, as is the habit of some not forsaking our own assembling together. I want to propose to you a radical thought on this issue of not forsaking ourselves, the privilege of gathering together in the name of Christ. Obviously, first of all, for worship, but fellowship and mutual support and encouragement and so on, because we are to encourage one another. Stimulate one another to love and good works. So what is so important about corporate worship? Beloved, I believe corporate worship is the ultimate expression, this side of heaven, of an understanding of the blessing of Christ overcoming aloneness, judicial aloneness. That if we do not appreciate the immeasurable privilege of gathering together to worship, first of all, we don't really understand the depth of what Christ was dealing with when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Taking seriously that antithesis of aloneness, the incredible blessing of being in a body that cares for one another in a world where aloneness and alienation is increasing, as always happens in a society that rejects God and then the word of God, suicides multiplying in every class of people, just one typical example, and when you decide to commit suicide, that's a tremendous acknowledgement that you do not understand the issue of aloneness and the solution of aloneness that is only in the grace of Jesus Christ. So, if you and I do not see in Christ's death and every aspect of his suffering, his fulfillment of God's just punishment on our behalf. You clearly do not understand salvation. That being saved is the fulfillment in the end of a connectedness with God that can never, ever be broken because the only instance of ultimate connectedness with God in all of eternity and human history is Jesus Christ in that one occasion on the cross being willing to be abandoned by God the Father so that you and I don't have to be abandoned by God his Father and Christ himself and the Holy Spirit. Treasure the privilege of corporate worship. 
as part of the training ground for developing relationship thinking that centers in Christ and has as its foundation Christ's relationship with his heavenly father as the model of ours. The model for ours. I want to close by taking you to John 17. John chapter 17, <clears throat> commonly called the great high priestly prayer. Verse 20. I do not ask on behalf of these alone, the disciples, they may be sanctified, but for all those also who believe in me through their word, meaning us, and Christians in every generation to follow after Jesus Christ and the apostles, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me, and I in you. God, are you saying that we are to experience a oneness that is infinitely the opposite of judicial aloneness? That we have a oneness that is a spin-off, perhaps I could say, of the oneness that Christ has with his Father and his Father has with him. And the glory, verse 22, which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. Amazing. Just as we are one. People by nature who are separated and alienated. I in them and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, that the world may know that you did send me and didst love me, love them even as you did love me. Father, I desire that they also whom you have given me be with me where I am. Amazing that Christ calls us creatures of dust, frail mortals, who unless Christ comes first will die that he calls us one with himself and that he says that he loves us as God the Father has loved his son. I can't comprehend that anywhere near its totality. I cannot begin to fully understand the depth, the breadth, the height, and the width of the love of God that is given to us in Christ Jesus. O oh, righteous Father, and verse 24, Father, I desire that they also whom you have given to me be with me where I am in order that they may behold my glory which you have given to me for you did love me before the foundation of the world. Remember that when you think of Eli, Eli, Sabachtha, Verse 25, O righteous Father, although the world has not known you, yet I have known you, and these have known you that you did send me. And I have made my name known to them, and will make it known that the love wherewith you did love me may be in them, and I in them. Dare any of us say we fully understand the immeasurable abundance of the love that Jesus Christ has for us, taking us from the darkness of an abandoning, rejecting world into the glorious and eternal connection of the gospel. Amen. Let's pray.